اعبدوا اياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين امين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم الحمد لله um, we are few days from ramadan so i was thinking maybe we talk about ramadan today inshallah uh, just unpack and prepare ourselves for this great month of blessings that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us in this ummah and uh, you know rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he put a lot of emphasis in in the in the fasting of ramadan in fact it's one of the pillars of our deen you know when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked about islam and he gave the five pillars of islam he said the first one is to say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah to testify second one is to establish the prayer pray five times a day third one is to fast in the month of ramadan and then give zakat and then perform hajj so fasting in the month of ramadan it's actually one of the foundational things you know in in our muslim identity and uh, it's something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has prescribed to us in the quran and he mentions in the quran kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum that we have prescribed for you fasting uh, just like we ha- we prescribed it for those who came before you in other words it's one of those acts of worship that uh, every single tradition that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down they had some form of fasting and uh, we know the story of uh, maryam alayhi salam when she is walking back to the town with her baby uh, she says inni nadartu lir rahman sawma that i'm going to fast on this day for ar rahman so they had their own uh, way of fasting that or their own tradition even if you look at the different religions today like hinduism uh, christianity buddhism they all have certain form of fasting you know even christians they have the lent tradition uh, so it's something that's that's part of every single tradition that has passed and what that what that tells us is uh, you know like if you're studying different life forms right you look at uh, you know frogs and you look at uh, octopus and you look at uh, different animals and you're looking at their genes and you find that all of them have you know one part of the gene the same gene gene every single one of them have that you know the the people that are studying the animals they may conclude well since every life form has this gene it may be that this gene is very necessary for life to exist so similarly when you look at the 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 tradition of fasting if you look at every religion they have some form of fasting and so so you know you can make the conclusion that fasting is an integral part of worship of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this has been the case since the beginning of time and so one of the beautiful things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions it as kutiba alaykum he has prescribed it for you he has written it for you he has made it law for you in other words you know fasting they can be optional there's optional fasting there's a uh, obligatory fasting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he pres- prescribed it for us now when do you get a prescription you know when you have some kind of uh, illness when you have some kind of sickness and you go to the doctor to get better or sometimes you may even have like certain deficiencies in your vitamins and things like this so there's prescription grade things that will actually help you and uh, it's not readily available over the counter uh, that being said fasting being prescribed it's a form of medicine that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us as humanity because in it there's a lot of different kinds of healings and i'm going to to get into some of it inshallah we're talking about healings in terms of the physical ailments you know our bodies but also healing in terms of our, our spirituality our our practice and our worship and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says la'allakum tattaqun so that you may have taqwa so the end goal of all of this is it's going to bring us to a state in which we're conscious and aware of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is a a mighty thing you know uh, to have the taqwa of allah this is the beginning of all the good things and uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says attaqullah yu'allimukum allah have taqwa of allah and allah will teach you so how do you have taqwa of Allah? Here's the way, fasting, right? Now, I wanted to begin with talking about some of the history before we get into the, the nuts and you know, bolts of this. 
when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came and he was, you know, teaching the message of Islam and he was receiving revelation, he had, you know, some people who were basically uh, from prophetic traditions in his life. So, so the Jews that were there, the Christians that were there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to inform them and confirm to them that this message that we're receiving now, this is a confirmation of what you have in your hands. And so, musaddiqan lima bayna yaday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this was the confirmation of what was given to them. And so originally the, the rules of fasting, the laws of fasting that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he implemented were in accordance with the laws that were shown in the Torah and the Injil. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he used to fast the same days that the Jews used to fast. And he used to fast in the same way that they used to fast. And their fasting was 24 hour periods. You know, it wasn't like the way we do now from iftar until maghrib time. Uh, from uh, Suhoor until Maghrib time. It used to be 24 hour periods. And the Prophet وسلم, he used to fast in these, in these circumstances, sometimes two, three days at a time. And, and the Sahaba, they would see the Prophet وسلم, fasting in this way and they would want to do it, but they couldn't do it. And so the Prophet وسلم, used to say, you know, Les, you know and alastu mithlukum, I am not like you. You know, my Lord, he gives me risk from the unseen. And so Rasulullah, his practice of fasting used to be different. Now this went on until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَعْرِفُونَهُمْ they, they recognize him as they would recognize their own children. Right? They saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is he the Prophet of Allah? You know, I mean, he, he certainly checks all the signs and he's fasting the way we fast. He has, he's receiving the, you know, he knows the names of the prophets. He's talking about the same rulings. He's calling people to the worship of Allah. So they had certain criteria, certain signs they're looking for to see is he really the messenger of Allah or not. And uh, he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he checked all their criteria. So they knew now without a shadow of doubt that he is the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, after they recognized he's the messenger of Allah, still they wanted to reject him. And they didn't just want to reject him, they wanted to assassinate him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and the reason for that was they were very upset that the messengerhood, the prophethood, had shifted from the children of Ishaq alayhi salam to the children of Ismail alayhi salam. And so, you know, the Arabs, they consider them a, a low quality, uh, second grade citizens, they call them Gentiles, you know, and, and if you wanted to be from the chosen people, they, they had this whole idea that the ethnicity, the, the lineage that you come from is part of you being chosen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his religion is not tied to any bloodline. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he shifts and he sends Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. And they don't like that. So they, out of, out of tribalism, out of animosity, out of racism, out of arrogance, they decide to assassinate and kill our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When that happens and they make that decision, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does two things. Now before this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he used to face Jerusalem to pray. So the Qibla was facing Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Baytul Maqdis. This is recognized as the Qibla for all the Abrahamic religions, right? So the Jews used to face there, the Christians used to face there. And now when they decide to turn against Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He changes the Qibla. And the Qibla is changed from Jerusalem to the Kaaba. And the second thing that happens is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala now abrogates all the laws of fasting and He brings forth the month of Ramadan. And he says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The, the month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an has descended. The Qur'an has been sent down. So whoever witnesses it should fast. You know, and, and, uh, you know, so, and, and you complete these days and that you, you glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding you to this. So in, in, in one shot, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically delivered the message that you want to get on, this, on the ark that's going to save humanity now. This is the ark. Get on the ark of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because all the other ummas and all their traditions and all the, the the teachings that they had come with has been abrogated and it's gone and it's finished, right? And the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala, the only door to enter it now is through the door of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so Allah subhanahu wa taala basically said, your qibla is no longer the qibla, and your fasting is no longer the fasting. Now the fasting with Allah subhanahu wa taala is the fasting of Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the Qibla to uh, Mecca. And he said, wherever you are, turn your faces to Masjid al-Haram. And all of that was to honor Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because in his heart, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was very difficult for him 
to turn his back to the Kaaba. But while he's in Medina, he was turning his back to the Kaaba and he was facing Jerusalem. But out of adab, he never asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change the Qibla. He would just look up, you know, in hope that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad nara taqallabu wajhaka fi sama. We saw you looking up at the sky. You turned your face towards the sky. So we changed the Qibla to that which makes you happy. You know, which makes you happy. And what's amazing about this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the Qibla to make the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa happy. And our scholars said, by extension, he also gave us Ramadan to make the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa happy. Why? Because uh, in Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said sallallahu alayhi wa from Ramadan to Ramadan, Allah wipes away all the sins. And whoever enters Ramadan and they fast with sincerity, hoping for a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, he will forgive them all the sins that have passed, every single one of them. So this is a big deal. <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and to his ummah. And he says, Why the reason, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us this form of fasting? Allah says, Allah, he intends and he wants to make things easy for you. And he does not want you to be in hardship. Now, what's amazing about this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something, you read Allah, Allah, he wanted something. Who is there that can say anything else? You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something, it's going to happen. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides something, nobody can resist, nobody can object, nobody can say anything about it. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving Ramadan, but Ramadan is just a symbol for something greater that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us. Allah, he wants for us ease. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ yusra. He wants for us to have ease. وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ And he does not want you to be in hardship. Now, what our scholars said is that if you, if you accept the gift of Ramadan and you go through it and you fast and you hope for mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has guaranteed for you ease from himself. And this is going to manifest the moment you know, in this life as well as in the hereafter. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises something, his promise does not change. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides something for his servant, his decision does not change. And he says, Ala inna awliya Allah. No doubt about it, the friends of Allah. La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. And there is no fear upon them, nor do they have anything to grieve about. Alladheena amanu wa kanu yattaqoon. These are people who have iman, they believe, and they have taqwa. They used to practice taqwa. How, what does it mean to practice taqwa? They used to fast. So that you can have taqwa. They used to establish the prayer. They used to give sadaqah. They used to do all these things, right? So, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ And then Allah says, لَهُمُ الْبُشْرَى فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We give them glad tidings in the life of this world. So you're going to hear in the life of this world that Allah, He wants ease for you. You're going to hear in the life of this world that Allah will give you and give you and give you until you're pleased. You're going to hear while you're alive in this world that Allah will forgive you your sins. You're going to hear in this world while you're alive that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prepare for you Jannah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe away all your shortcomings and all these things. All of that you're going to hear them and this is a promise from Allah no matter which mouth brings them to you. right? This is coming to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ And in the hereafter, when you come to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the words of Allah will not change. In other words, all these glad tidings that reached you, all these, you know, you know, news, good news that reached you, they're not going to be flipped and changed for you. Why? Because you are a believer and you practice taqwa. And you fasted in Ramadan. And one of the beauties of Ramadan, our scholar said, is that, you know, all the other acts of worship, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my servant, all of your acts of worships are for you and your fasting is for me. And I will reward it according, you know, without measure. So, so what our scholars said is that, what does that mean? You know, all your acts of worship is for you, but fasting is for me. They said everything that you do, you know, from prayer to giving sadaqah to going to hajj, all of these different actions that you do, they all have a certain physical element to it, so certain outward aspect to it, that others can see you doing it, that others can you know, watch you, that others can praise you for it. But fasting, nobody can see that. 
Fasting is something hidden. It's a secret that you're, you know, you're not doing something extra. You're actually doing something less. And so, so you're abstaining from your food. You're abstaining from your water. You're abstaining from certain things. And that, you know, in and of itself, nobody can tell you're fasting. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows. And he knows the reward of fasting. The angels don't even know the reward of fasting. So that being said, fasting is a, is a proof of sincerity. Fasting is a proof of a person's iman and dedication and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because, you know, food and drink and all these things, these are stuff that we need to survive. And we have innate desire to, to be pulled towards those things. You know, a lot of people now, we're constantly grazing. You know, we have chips here and you have soda here and you have food here and you have food there. And you always have like some kind of snack with you. Now, when you're fasting, your body is saying, what's going on? You know, I'm hungry, feed me. But you're telling your body, no, I'm fasting for Allah's sake. And you're going to, to, to keep yourself hungry while your, your entire body is screaming and saying, I'm thirsty, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. And you're saying no to the body so that you can say yes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're saying no to your desires. So you're saying, so you can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a form of sacrifice that takes sincere devotion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, he's basically saying, this is for me, you know, and I'm going to reward it without limits. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he told us about the rewards of fasting in the month of Ramadan. It's not just the act of fasting itself, but the month of Ramadan is also a sacred month. Because in this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent down the Quran to Lawh al-Mahfuz, right? And our scholars, they said, from that moment on, you know, in Laylatul Qadr, the Quran came down, inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr, we sent it down in Laylatul Qadr. The Quran descended from the eternal, pre-eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into a realm called Lawh al-Mahfuz where nobody can enter it except the purified angels and the chosen ones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then from there on, Jibreel alayhi salam brought it piecemeal with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam over 23 years. But that initial you know, light that descended into the realm of the creation from the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it happened in the month of Ramadan, especially, specifically in the night of Laylatul Qadr, right? So our scholars said that, that this is a sacred night, a sacred month, because in this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed from his light into the creation. And he, 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 he sent down from his presence into the realm, which is, which is, which is an abode of darkness and, you know, so, this, this entire realm was illuminated in the month of Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan al-lazi unzila fihi al-Quran. Right? So this is the month in which the Quran came down. So this is the month of the Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, you know, you know, hold on to the Quran in this month. And, uh, you know, and, and, and increase in your recitation of it. So that's why if you notice a lot of the masajid, they do their tarawihs and they do khatam in this month because of the, the, the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But another thing is fasting in Ramadan has special merit than fasting other days. You know, we have Sunnah fastings like Mondays and Thursdays. We have fasting the three full moon days. But fasting in Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if you miss one day of fasting in Ramadan and you were to make up for it by fasting all the rest of your life, you would not make up for that one day. So, so that one day is so valuable. You can fast the rest of your life and it will not make up for that one day. So this is something, uh, you know, to, to, to really think about. You know, th what is the value of this month? And our scholars, they likened it to, you know, ayyam and ma'dudat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, counted number of days, you know, meaning it's not, con it's not an unlimited amount of time. It's actually a very short amount of time, you know, few number of days. And so it's almost like somebody took you to the mall, gave you a credit card and said, Go and buy whatever you want. It's all on us, but you have, you know, one hour. So in that one hour, you're not going to move slow and sluggish and say, yeah, do I want this? Do I not want this? You're going to do the best you can to grab as much as you can, right? So similarly, you know, the 30 days of Ramadan, these are, these are days that are counted and it's not going to stay forever. Right now we're talking about Ramadan coming, right? In a moment, you're going to be like, oh man, it's Ramadan, right? You, you'll be preparing to to have iftar and you'll be fasting. And, and then within a few moments, you're like, man, I miss Ramadan. It's gone. It's going to pass by very quickly. So when it's here, when it's, when it's present and you're in Ramadan, you have to increase whatever you can in capacity because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us this is a sacred month and this is a month of blessings. 
And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the doors of Jannah are opened in Ramadan. The doors of Hellfire are closed in Ramadan. The shayateen are chained up in Ramadan. So this is, uh, you know, and, and the sins are forgiven. So this is something that you want to take full advantage of to the, to the maximum capacity that you can. And another thing, our scholars, they mentioned that Laylatul Qadr, you know, is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the Quran. Laylatul Qadr khayrun min al shahr. Laylatul Qadr is better than 1,000 months. Right? Some of the people think Laylatul Qadr is equal to 1,000 months. No, it's not equal to 1,000 months. It's what? It's better than 1,000 months. It could be 100,000 months. It could be, you, only Allah knows. But it's something that is vast and it's something huge. And whoever worships in Laylatul Qadr has the reward of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all these years. Right? And, and if you convert 1,000 months to years, 83 years, right? That's a whole lifespan, 83 years. But it's more than that. So if you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Laylatul Qadr, and you're given that gift of Laylatul Qadr, then you, you have worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for thousands of years. And this is something that's that's specifically for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And so this is uh, something, it's the sport of Ramadan, because Laylatul Qadr, uh, nobody knows exactly which day it is. There's a lot of speculation some of the people, they say it's the night of the 27th. Some of them say it's the night of this. Some of them say it's the night of that. Some people will have signs. Some people will have dreams. Some people will have, you know, they, they look at the stars in the night or they look at the sunrise in the morning to find out whether it was Laylatul Qadr or not. But the reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden Laylatul Qadr. And a lot of the scholars, they said, it's usually it's in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, usually it's in the odd nights. Usually it's in the last 10 nights. And it's, sometimes it's the 27th. So, but it's not always the 27th. It's not always the odd nights. It's not always the last 10 nights. It could be the first night of Ramadan. So what that means is you don't know which one of those nights is Laylatul Qadr. So, you know, normally, typically what we do is when Ramadan is about to enter, we're all excited. You know, Ramadan is coming. Ramadan is coming. And we prepare for it. And we, we first day of Ramadan, you go to the masjid, you know, Taraweeh prayers are packed. The guys are outside saying, you know, you can't come in here. It's, it's, we're full. There's nobody, there's no room left. And then what happens? Second day, third day, fourth day, the rows start dropping out one by one by one. Right? And the people's uh, excitement starts to wean off and they, they become more sober. And then in the middle 10 days, people are most lax, most relaxed. They're actually sleeping through the day staying up, watching movies through the night. And then in the last 10 days, oh, Laylatul Qadr, let's get back to the masjid. So the masjid starts filling up again. But our scholar said that, you know, if you're really adamant about finding Laylatul Qadr and you're really looking for it, then don't, don't belittle any day of Ramadan. Any one of them could be it. And if you go with that intention, our scholar said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you according to your intention. So whoever's intention is to find Laylatul Qadr, and they're working and striving for it every single night of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the reward of Laylatul Qadr every single night of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. Allah can do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that. So, your actions are judged by your intentions. So if your intention is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and find Laylatul Qadr, and you're sincere and you're, you're devoted and you're holding on, you have the reward of Laylatul Qadr for every day of Ramadan. And this is, you know, and people, they, they, they get out of it what they put into it. So uh, another thing our scholars they mentioned is that, you know, when you, when you enter Ramadan, of course, there's a spiritual uplifting because now as a, as a community, everybody's together. They're fasting. They're focusing on the Quran. Shaitan is locked up. Everybody's, you know, in the masjid. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're watching their gaze. They're, they're thinking clearly. They're, you know, all that stuff is going on. So naturally... There is an aura of spirituality in the air. You know, the hearts are lifted. And what happens as soon as Ramadan ends, you have some people they want to celebrate by going to a party, right? Some people they celebrate by getting drunk. Some people can celebrate by getting high. And so they kind of undo all the good that they did as soon as they exit Ramadan, right? And, and what happens? It's like you climb the mountain and you got really high and then you jumped off a cliff. That's what happens to a lot of people. So... Naturally, when you, when you enter Ramadan, there's a lot of spiritual gifts that are given to you. And our scholars said, as soon as Ramadan ends, the shayateen, they are set free and they come after you. They want to rob you again. 
And, and so you have to hold on to the gifts of Ramadan as much as you can with whatever intensity that you have. But at the same time, know and recognize that Ramadan was a gift for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the highs and the lows that you experience are part of Iman. The Prophet sallallahu somebody came to him, said, Ya Rasulullah, when we're with you, we can see Jannah in front of our eyes and we can see hellfire in front of our eyes and we can see the hereafter as if it's already happening. And they said, when we go back home, said we, 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 we become busy with dunya and we become this and we become that. And the Prophet sallallahu said, don't worry about it. That's normal. Right? Iman, he said sallallahu has its ups and downs. If you were to stay in the state that you're in, when you're with the Prophet sallallahu if you were to stay in the state that you're in, when you are, when you're, you know, in the in the state of, uh, you know, fasting in Ramadan, that spiritual high, then you would see the angels come and shake your hands in the streets. You'd be able to see them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it so that your, your iman goes up and it comes down. It goes up and it comes down. But our goal is to make sure that every time it goes up, it goes higher than it was before. And every time it comes down, it doesn't go lower than the last time. Right? So, so you're constantly moving upwards you know, towards the end of our life. And we want to die in the state of highest Iman. Uh, I, my computer is saying it's going to restart in 14 minutes. So whatever I need to say, I need to say it before it, it shuts me down. Um, so anyway, uh, lastly, uh, now they're doing a lot of studies on intermittent fasting, right? And they're finding out that actually if, if you abstain from food and drink and you, you, you try to you know, control your intake, they're finding out that the stomach, the gut, is actually the, the source of all kinds of problems that we're facing today. All the diseases, everything can be traced back to the gut, whether it's the gut bacteria, whether it's the, the digestion system, the stomach acid, or all these things. And they're finding out that intermittent fasting, actually, it, it resets your body to a state of health and a state of well-being. And they're finding out that, you know, every time your cells divide, you know, there's dead cells that are left over behind, you know, and, and what happens as they accumulate and they accumulate and they accumulate, they, they start to cause all kinds of sicknesses, ALS disease, ner nervous disorders, all these different things. But when you're fasting, your body tends to clean itself up. So they're finding all these different things. Now, people that have a, you know, problem with blood sugar levels, you know, if they're regular in fasting, the body starts to regulate its blood sugar, the pancreas heals itself. Then now they're finding out that fasting actually, you know, clears out brain fog. It, it, it actually helps with memory loss. It helps with, so, so there's so many medical benefits now they're finding about fasting. And they're saying that instead of medication, we have to start fasting, you know, because a lot of people that are going through like uh, uh, certain illnesses, right now the main, you know, mainstream ideology in medicine is medicate them. You know, whatever problem you have, we have a pill for that. But now they're finding out that the pills actually have all these other side effects. But fasting is a natural way of letting the body get back to its normal state and, and heal itself and repair the DNA and repair the cells and all these things. So, you know, I, I want you to also look into just research the benefits of intermittent fasting and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Kutib alaykum as You know, we have prescribed for you fasting. So I have 12 minutes. I think I talked for half an hour. I'm going to open the floor for questions and answers. And then uh, if we get shut off, inshallah, we have some questions answered. Bismillah. Any questions? Don't tell me I was on mute this whole time. Okay. Question about fasting. Two questions. Bismillah. What are the questions? I have a question. Um, I think while, um, oh, I think they wrote, wrote it in the chat. Okay. If you wake up late for Sahur, do you still fast? Yes. Uh, don't worry about dehydration. You know, when somebody's uh, uh, sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives exception. You know, somebody elderly, they can't fast, or somebody who's pregnant, or somebody who's nursing. Those are exceptions. But if you're a young, healthy person, and you're able to fast, suhoor is barakah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, wake up for suhoor, for it is barakah. 
and uh, waking up for suhoor is actually an act of worship. But if for some reason you're unable to do that, you can still fast and you should fast because it's, it's the month of Ramadan and uh, dehydration is not going to, to, to be much of a problem. You can actually go for three, four days without drinking water and you'll be, all, you'll be okay, inshallah. Uh, I'm not recommending you do that, but you know, your body can handle that. And, and fasting is not, you know, it's not more than 16 hours, you know, uh, in the in the times that we're living in, in, in the in the the hemisphere that we're at, in the latitude, uh, longitude. If you look at where we are, maximum maybe 15, 16 hours. Different in North Pole and South Pole, but you can handle 16 hours, inshallah. Your body can handle that. There will be no halaqa during the Ramadan, but uh, you can go to uh, the masjid, inshallah. They might have some things. Uh, last time I had brain fog, two days. Uh, you know, when you start fasting initially, you, your body starts to go through certain changes. And, and in the beginning, few first few days, there's, a, there's an adaptation process. Because uh, when, you, when you're not fasting, normally we have so much sugar intake. We, take, we eat so much sugar. And your brain gets used to metabolizing this, this raw, readily available energy. Uh, and uh, when you start fasting the first few days, your body has to readjust the way it burns energy and other things. And so, so you might feel, uh, you know, a bit tired. You might feel, you know, a bit out of energy. You might have some brain fog first couple of days, but after that, you you, you start to adjust, and it will become easier. And this is uh, this is tried and tested, and everybody who's fasted can tell you that. Inshallah. How can you improve your prayer dhikr during Ramadan if you don't feel anything while doing it? Uh, good question. When we pray and we do dhikr and we worship and do all these things. Our intention is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they might have spiritual experiences. They start Allahu Akbar. They, they, they start feeling the, the bodily high. They start feeling buzz up, going up and down their spine. All of these things are good and well. And they, they, sometimes Allah will give them to us to encourage us to worship. But sometimes the test is, all right, you said you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and prayer is so sweet to you. Well, I'm going to take away the sweetness of it. Right? Are you still going to worship? You, you said you're going to make dhikr, and when you make dhikr, you feel spiritually high. Well, I'm going to make it so it's dry. Are you still going to make dhikr? So, uh, you know, then you arrive to a point. This is part of the spiritual uh, wayfaring is that you arrive to a point where you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and your worship is for Allah alone, not for any kind of feeling, not for any kind of sensation, not for any kind of, you know, states that you enter into. It becomes solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you can pass through that valley, then all of those things will come back, inshallah. All right, next question. Uh, what if someone intentionally doesn't eat for sahur? They only wake up to say fajr and then continue on with their day. Uh, that's okay. The fast is still valid. Uh, but if you if you do eat sahur, that's better for you. At least have like a, a cup of water. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this is his sunnah. And we follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the best of our abilities. If you miss a prayer, does it break your fast? No, prayer does not break your fast. Uh, break, missing a prayer does not break your fast. The things that break your fast is eating, as uh, you know, uh, drinking, uh, and, and, and these are technicalities, right? Or, or vomiting to a point where your mouth is full of vomit and, and you know, uh, or, or you know, you know. So, you know, those are the things. Uh, you know, some of the scholars, they add to it, you know, if you have excessive bleeding, things like this. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you can avoid those things, your fast is valid, inshallah. Uh, earlier you said shayateen, bad evils fall. Earlier you said shayateen, do bad evil jinns fall? And yes, shayateen, there are human shayateen and jinn shayateen. So, you know, all the evil jinn, they're considered shayateen. Uh, evil human beings are also considered shayateen. But the shayateen that get locked up in Ramadan are the jinn shayateen, not the human shayateen. Um, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection from all of them. Can I still fast while in school? Yes, you can fast while you're in school. What about donating blood during Ramadan? If you can avoid it, do that. If you have to do it, uh, some of the scholars said it breaks your fast, so, so be careful with that. If someone has common cold, do they still fast since it is illness but not major illness? If you're able to fast, you can fast. But if... The, the fasting exasperates your illness. For example, somebody has diabetes and uh, their blood sugar levels are not regulated. So if they fast 
they're going to faint or they're going to, you know, get, you know, very sick. In those cases, they don't have to fast. In fact, fasting for them is prohibited. They cannot fast because the doctor says you should not fast. You cannot fast uh, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, says, uh, do not harm yourselves, you know, and, and, and sometimes the exception comes, you know, if, so, if, if fasting is going to hurt you, you're not allowed to fast. But because you can't fast, you have to feed 30 people, you know, uh, you know, their, their nafaqa. So uh, this is, you know, the deen makes it easy, inshallah. So anyway, if somebody has come and called, okay, is it any other questions? Yeah, quick one. So, um, if she, I think get locked up during Ramadan, why do people still do like bad things? You know. Good question. So we talked about shayateen of ins and shayateen of jinn, right? The shayateen of jinn. These are the the entities that that do waswasa. You know, these are the things that come into your thoughts and they. So, so you will notice if if you're like if you're paying attention and you're you're doing what they call muraqaba, you will notice some of the thoughts that you have are regular recurring thoughts that are part of your own psyche. Some of the thoughts that you have, they just come out of nowhere, right? For example, somebody just walking down the street, suddenly they see a thought where they're doing something terrible that would never even think about doing. But that thought just appears in their thought in their mind. Those type of thoughts, they are not from you, they are from other entities, you know, and they're floating around. The Prophet said they float through your body like blood flows through your flows through your veins. So what happens in, in Ramadan, those type of foreign, you know, evil thoughts, they are they are pushed away. They don't enter. However, the human nafs itself can become a type of shaitan. Right? So so if your nafs is not tamed, if you, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nafsul ammaratu bisu, the nafs that that encourages evil, that commands evil. If you have a nafs that has not been tamed, that is still, you know, attached and addicted to all sorts of things that are not permissible. That's not going to go away. That's part of who, that's part of who you are, and and wherever you go, whatever time you're in, you're going to take yourself with you. You know, so even if Ramadan comes, you still have to struggle against yourself. You still have to fight against your hawa, your own nafs, your own desires, and these are things that that you know. A lot of the things that people fall into in Ramadan is is things that are related to the the human nafs. Now, some, you know, nafs, you know, kathiba, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nafs can become a liar, a nafs can become a, a corrupt, plotting, scheming nafs, a nafs can become uh, somebody that's full of lust, somebody who's full of greed. So, so, so there's all sorts of diseases that can afflict the human heart, that can afflict the human nafs. And so, you know, if, if those qualities, they persist in, in Ramadan, that means it's part of us and it's, it's an indication that something we have to work on. And something we have to get rid of, inshallah. So those are not from shayateen. I mean, we can become shayateen too. May Allah protect us. Um, I know this is an unreliable source, but I saw some tweet on Twitter that excessive talking is haram. Okay, yes. Uh, the Prophet wasallam he said, were it not for your excessive talking and your hatred for one another, you would see marvels, you know, that, that I can see. So, so one of the, the things about uh, you know, spiritually mature people is that their words are few, but they're profound, right? But what, when somebody's not spiritually mature, they're going to to engage in all sorts of com uh, conversations, gossiping, things like this. And those are things, you know, some of the talking, it can be permissible, some of it is not permissible. Uh, but excessive talking, it's not haram, but it's disliked. It's disliked. Um, uh, but also depends on the subject in the in the conversation that you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about somebody behind their back, that's haram, that's backbiting, right? But if you're talking about the football game and you don't stop talking until people get annoyed with you, that's that's dislike. <laughs> uh, can we get preventative vaccine while fasting? Uh, some of the scholars, they say, for example, uh, like if you go to the dentist, you get an injection or you get some kind of a shot that it doesn't break your fast, but there is a khilaf about it. You know, there is a difference of opinion. Others, they do consider it to break the vaccine, your fast, for example, getting IVs and, and shots and all these things. And they say it's because it's going through, it's something is entering into your body. So the fiqh discussion, the debate is, is it just getting food or something past your throat or is it something entering into your body? 
right? And so, so one opinion is that when you do gargara, you 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 gargle. If water goes past your your throat, that breaks your fast. But if you get a shot from here, that doesn't break your fast because it's going through a different channel. Other scholars just say no, it's not this channel or that channel. It's the idea of something entering your body and something you know. So so there's a khilaf about it. I, I would say follow up with your local scholar, inshallah, and, and see what they say. Does laughing, giggling break your wudu? I saw a hadith, someone prayed, but he was laughing. Well, yeah. So there's a difference of opinion on this. The Hanafi scholars, they consider if you laugh while you're praying, if you laugh while you're praying, your wudu is done. You have to go make wudu. Have four seconds, three seconds. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum. I think his computer restarted now. Um, so I'll be closing it off, but just one quick note I wanted to make was um, some people get demotivated um, after, like during Ramadan because they know that if they're on like that spiritual high right after, like a week after, they're just gonna dip back down and crash. Um, but I, like the metaphor that he kind of explained was that it's almost like building like a tower. If you're down here and you wanna be up here eventually, every Ramadan, you're just building a floor, another like a series of stairs just to get up there. Um, and like, even if you just build, um, one level per Ramadan, as long as you maintain that, and then the next Ramadan, you just keep building, you'll get to your goal eventually. And yeah, so that's, that's all I had to say, but, uh, Jazakallah, hey everyone for coming. Um, this is our last uh, halakha till after Ramadan. So we'll text or send the remind, um, once that comes up and yeah, so welcome, Jazakallah for coming and hope you have a wonderful Ramadan. Thank you.